Hi, welcome. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, it's uh, that, that, that the topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, just to set some expectations, this lecture is actually part of a free day training we are doing. So it's a, it's a pretty optimistic goal to explain to you all the, the, the nitty gritty details uh, in, in 60 minutes. So we won't, yeah. Um, but I, I wanna basically, the, the plan is to, to, to set the scene to, um, to, to show you some challenges and some, some options you have here. And, um, and show you a library um, towards the end that hopefully uh, allows you to use these technologies without having to attend the free day training <laughs> just for this purpose. Okay, so my name is Dominic and um, I'm, a, I'm a, cons uh, a consultant working mainly or well exclusively with companies that produce software of, of some sort. Um, that's either like, you know, in-house software or they are, um, they're a software development company or ISVs or whatever. And, uh, you know, um, these, these companies have, have uh, needs around authentication and authorization. So uh, many, many years ago, we started an open source project called Identity Server, which is an open source implementation uh, of various authentication protocols, you know, started with you know, back in the days with WS Security and WS Federation and WS Trust and, and for the last couple of years, uh, it's mainly focusing on, on the modern authentication protocols as we call them, uh, which is mainly, um, you know, OpenID Connect and OAuth. So that's what I do every single day. Um, as I said, we started with the server side of that and once this, you know, became uh, got more traction. You no know, people actually wanted to build client applications uh, to talk to the server. So you know, Microsoft has a strong offering uh, for client libraries in the ASP.NET space. Um, but there weren't a lot of good client libraries for you know, um, uh, on one end for you know JavaScript style clients. So that's what my colleague Brock is mainly focusing on, and um, native applications. And that could be you know. Um, your good old WPF or WinForms application or a, a modern mobile app like, like the ones you do with Xamarin. So that's what I'm focusing on, um, building this client library um, in addition to the server stuff. Um, what else is to say? Well, I think the rest is just, uh, you know, my email address, my blog, where you can get my slide decks and things like that. Okay. so. Just to set the scene uh, and, uh, and that, that, you know, just to make sure you understand where I'm basically coming from when I'm talking about these technologies is, is um, you know, basically software that looks like this. Yeah? Uh, basically, you have a, a couple of, you know, back-end things running, web applications, web APIs, and you want to connect uh, clients to it. And um, these clients, um, can, can come in many shapes and forms these days, right? They could be, you know, browser-based client where it's more like server-side code or more like client-side code. It could be um, native applications like Windows apps or iOS or Android apps, um, or it could be server-to-server -server style communication and so on. And, you know, they all need some sort of authentication and authorization going on. And um, the, you know, the, just the way how these modern applications work these days is that the users might use different types of clients even throughout the day to access the same backend. So you really don't want to implement security over and over again in, in all of these boxes. So that's why it's uh, actually pretty common to, to put in an abstraction in your system that takes care of all the authentication needs. And, you know, that was back in the days called Active Directory or the domain controller, right? But um, since Kerberos is not the best protocol on the, in the cloud these days, um, we, we need something else. And um, that's OpenID Connect. That's basically the most popular protocol these days to, to fulfill this role of a centralized authentication service. Um, and obviously by um, sharing the same authentication service across multiple client applications, you get things like, you know, single sign-on and single sign-out, 
and you get benefits of um, federation so that maybe your provider trusts other providers that may be on one end, you know, things like Google and Facebook, but on the other hand, like business to business style, um, trust relationships and so on. And the idea is that all of your applications, they don't care anymore, right? Uh, there is something on your network that takes care of that. And that's, that's your security token service, as the, um, some people often say. Um, but uh, in, in short, this, this thing takes care of all the heavy lifting around authentication and producing these tokens and, uh, you know, brokering trust to external authentication systems and all these things. So, in other words, um, this is a simplification, even if some, not everybody believes that it makes things simpler, it does make things simpler, because you only need to implement it once and not five times, yeah? or one, you know, again and again for each client you're, you're, you're bringing on board or for each API you're bringing on board. So, that's kind of the space where I mostly live in. Um, and the, one of the, the things uh, probably that, that is most important or, or very important here is that in, in this space, you often have multiple clients talking to the same backend. You might, you, you know, you might make different architectural decisions if you only have this one client, yeah, and it's only your backend. And it's, you know, like only, you know, like a, a small set of services you want to authenticate with and you don't have external trust relationships, then you might make different architectural decisions. But, you know, if this one client becomes two clients, then you are now in the, in, you know, it, you, you need to make a choice if you want to re-implement these authentication features again or if you maybe want to, you know, hoist them up to a, to one, one level above and share them between, um, between your, your, your applications, right? And that's where this thing, uh, OpenID Connect, comes in. This is a protocol that allows you to separate out uh, things like authentication and account linking and federation and single sign-on and all these things into a separate piece, and then all your, all your applications just use it as a service, okay? Now, here comes the scary slide. Uh, obviously, um, you need to you need protocols to connect all these different types of clients to um, to your to your token service, right? And um, you, you might have heard of other protocols in the past, like for example, WS Federation or SAML 2P, and they were and they were only focused on one single use case, which was you know, web-based single sign-on. So they, they were designed before the iPhone, right? Um, so th their, their main, main purpose was to give you single sign-on for server, you know, classic server-rendered web applications. But, you know, the world has changed. Um, we have all these different types of clients, so we need protocols that can deal with all these use cases. And, you know, it's like SAML2P or WSFED, they can't deal with JavaScript clients. They can't deal with native clients. They are just, you know, uh, designed for browsers. So, to you know, for, for for making all that happen, we needed a new protocol. And, and you know, like, and, and there's a lot of confusion out there because many people thought that that that's OAuth, right? OAuth is the thing that you authenticate with, and uh, all the big companies. Um, they did their best to make this even more confusing, right? Your people log in with OAuth and there's the OAuth authentication service and so on and so forth. And OAuth is not an authentication protocol, just to make that really clear. OAuth is a protocol that, um, that allows you to request access tokens to talk to APIs. It doesn't authenticate the human that is actually using your application or is using your system. So many, many people um, including, you know, Microsoft and Google and Facebook and so on, they made their own proprietary extensions to OAuth to, you know, add these last 20% to add this authentication functionality to OAuth. And obviously, they, you know, they, they all did it on their own and it, it was all proprietary and, you know, uh, they didn't work together. And um, that's the reason why, you know, when you look at, for example, in ASP.NET, 
you have a Google handler and a Facebook handler and a Twitter handler and a, a Dropbox handler, you know, uh, you name them, right? The, um, the reason for that is because um, they all did their own proprietary implementations. Now, OpenID Connect, the idea behind OpenID Connect is really to add once and for all these extensions for authentication on top of OAuth in a standards compliant way. So in other words, if you implement OpenID Connect or if you buy into OpenID Connect uh, on, and, and use one of the OpenID client libraries or servers, then it's guaranteed, you know, that's a strong word, but <laughs> there are really good chances that they are all compatible with each other, right? So in AC.NET, for example, there's only one OpenID Connect handler which works with any OpenID Connect implementation. Um, the library I'm going to show you later is also an OpenID Connect client implementation for .NET, and it works with any standards compliant OpenID Connect provider, okay? So in other words, you're really dealing with two protocols, OAuth and OpenID Connect. OpenID Connect is the thing that typically comes first. It, that's where, you know, that, that's how you authenticate the human. And OAuth is then the thing that allows to delegate that identity of that human to a backend service. Yeah? Um, so, for example, when you, from your mobile app, you call an API, and the API needs to know who, who is right now holding this device in his hands, because, you know, we need to um, do authorization based on the, on the identity. That is OAuth, the delegation part. But figuring out in the first place who the user is, that is OpenID Connect. So that, that's the relationship between these two protocols. There's a, there's a question here, where are the, the slides? I'll um, show that link again at the end to my speaker deck, and I will upload the slides at the end there. Uh, and you can find all my, my conference slides there. And and I'll, okay. we have we'll have a link on uh, the Dameron University website too after the guest lecture too. Okay, excellent. Um, so yeah, so that's the picture you're going to see when you go to OpenID.net/connect. Yeah, um, that's the OpenID Connect protocol suite, and you can see um, that at, at the bottom what they call the underpinnings. That's OWARF. Yeah. Um, Anybody who spent some time with the OAuth specification, uh, A, probably was confused, <laughs> B, was probably frustrated, and, and C, maybe lost interest because OAuth is a very, how should I say that? It, 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 it has a lot of space for, you know, for custom implementations, right? So that the sentence, uh, the, the, um, that at the discretion of the implementer, that is used quite heavily. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons, um, um, that's one of the reasons why there are so many incompatible OAuth implementations because, you know, they all implement the OAuth spec with all the freedom that it gave them, but it was so much freedom that in the end, nothing worked together really, yeah? Um, so what OpenID Connect is doing is- So Dominic, real, real quick, some, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt here, Dominic. We have a question though, I just want to clarify before we go on. Um, yep. So the question is, so basically OpenID is authenticate and OAuth is authorized. Is that, did you agree? Yeah, it would be nice if the world would be that simple. <laughs> <laughs> um, OpenID Connect is authentication, that's, that's for sure. OAuth is the protocol that allows the client application to request access tokens to talk to API. So in, in, in a sense, it is authorization because it decides if a client can talk to an API or not. But it is not, you know, more, but it stops at this coarse grained level. Okay? So once the client makes that call to the API and is inside the API, all of the authorization based on who is the user and what is the user allowed to do and all these things are, are not part of OAuth. They are, they are application logic. Okay? So yeah. Great. Thank um, you. So, so what OpenID Connect really does is it puts some constraints on OAuth, yeah? So it, it basically uh, extends the protocol in a way that says things have to be done like this, yeah? Um, for example, let's say the, the crypto algorithm, it allows, they, they made a selection of, of the allowed crypto based on popularity. So, you know, for example, RSA with SHA-256, they made that decision because this is the mostly 
implemented crypto library on all platforms. Yeah, so to make interop easier. The next thing is right at, at, the, at the bottom of the screen, you see these, these things like JWT. Yeah, so what's that? That's the so-called JSON web token. And that's the token type that is um, transmitting the identity of the user or, or you know, like uh, that's how we transmit these access tokens. Again, OAuth on its own didn't have didn't say how tokens have to look like. They, they, they just said, you use a token, yeah? And again, people came up with their own custom token implementations. Now in OpenID Connect, they say, you have to use a JSON web token, okay? And again, the, the reason for that is interop, yeah? JSON, obviously JSON is the data format which is mostly, you know, most widely available on all platforms. So JSON web token is a, to a, a token format based on JSON, and again, they made this decision to 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 um, you know to mandate the token type so to, to have better interoperability between systems. Um, JWS stands for JSON Web Token Signatures, and JWE stands for JSON Web Token Encryption, and you know J JWK for keys, and J JWA for algorithms. So you know, even if many people tell you it's all easier, well, they are they're right. It's easier than before, but it's still you know, it's a non-trivial problem. You need things like signatures and encryption and key material and algorithms and all these things. But that's the job of libraries um, to abstract these things away from you. And the good thing, the good news here is, is that, yeah, you only need one library, which is your OpenID Connect client library, and not one for Google and not one for, you know, Microsoft and so on and so on. And that's, that's hopefully soon a thing of the past when everybody finally move to OpenID Connect, and we are on a good way here. So at the top, you see the OpenID Connect specific things. Yeah, for example, um, what they call core. Core is basically uh, the specification uh, for different types of applications, how they do authentication. So you can imagine that an MVC application does it a little bit different than, than a JavaScript application compared to a native application, for example. And all these flavors, they also call them flows or profiles, they are specified uh, in, in core. Um, one interesting thing is session management, yeah? So, Funnily enough, yeah, since OAuth was never designed to be an authentication protocol, there was no notion of logout, right? And, you know, everybody's talking about single sign-on, but most people forget single sign-out. Because if you, you know, uh, if, if you start um, opening multiple applications, they all, you know, have personal data of you in, in, in memory or on disk, whatever, you probably want to, you know, have some way of, of telling them all to, you know, get rid of it again, yeah? Um, as you all know, you know, uh, uh, data is the pollution of the information age. That's pretty hard, yeah? So, um, and you know, the, the reason was that all these companies that implemented OAuth in the first place, like Google and Facebook and so on, they weren't really interested in you signing out, you know? I mean, Google, if you sign out of Google, they, you know, they can't track you anymore on the web, so why would sign out be interesting? Um, so, OpenID Connect adds the notion of, uh, you know, like cleaning a session or closing a session uh, and notifying all the applications which are part of that session to clean up data. Um, discovery is another interesting one here, which is about how to um, provide a machine readable description of your OpenID Connect server so that client libraries can use that information to automatically uh, or configure them. Okay, so in other words, the idea is it should be super simple to write a client because all of the hard stuff can be done by machines and how these machines learn about the configuration is the so-called discovery endpoint. Okay, so the next thing is um, there is an OpenID certification going on at the OpenID Foundation and the whole idea is that um, as an implementer of OpenID, either you know, like you wrote, you wrote a client library or you wrote a server implementation, um, you can certify that implementation against the spec, and you can make sure basically that your implementation is spec compliant. Uh, again, the, the main driver here is um, is uh, interop. So, 
when we go quickly to the Open ID Foundation and go to certification here, you can see that, that there are two areas here. One is certified Open ID providers. These are the server implementations. Um, and you can now see, you know, all the really good implementations here, for example, and, you know, some others. <laughs> um, you can see basically for which profile these implementations are certified. So basic is basic, implicit is for JavaScript, and hybrid is something which, you know, we, we often use in native applications or the basic one as well. Depends uh, a little bit. And config is the support for, the, for this discovery endpoint I mentioned earlier. And then you can basically see when that implementation got certified. Um, or, you know, if there are things missing here, then they might not be spec compliant. Now, the relying party section at the bottom of the screen is our client libraries, right? So, so these are the things that, that, that you can use to connect to an OpenID server. Um, and the, the promise here is basically that, you know, if you have a client library that is cert certified for a certain profile, it will be compatible with a server that is certified for the same profile. Okay, so and here are two libraries, the, the ones I mentioned earlier, one from my colleague called um, um, Brock Allen, which is a, a JavaScript library, and one is mine, which I'll show you later, which is the .NET version of that, if you want, for native apps. Okay. Um, and pretty quickly, that, that, that's the, the implementation I'm working on. It's called Identity Server. It's, um, it's a Apache 2.NET based uh, OpenID Connect provider, and I'm gonna use that for my demos later, later on, but um, as I said, since my library uh, is certified, it should work with any OpenID provider that is you know, certified as well, or at least you know, very close to the spec. Cool, so that's the introduction, and as I said, um, we have a lot of ground to cover, really. So let's let's switch some switch some gears um, to from you know the, the general what is OAuth and so on. Let's switch to the the native mobile um, scenario. So there are many when you look around, um, there are many homegrown solutions out there. Um, uh, attempts to to write client libraries, which were all really riddled by the fact that back in the days, the server implementations were not compatible. You know, like the client library you're using might work with Google, but it doesn't work with Facebook. Um, and if you look at the protocols, you figure out, well, it's all proprietary and so on. So, so um, as I said, op 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 Openly Connect tries to, to remedy that fact. Now, uh, another working group at the IETF, which are the people that write the RFCs, yeah, um, they at the same time established a document that talks about best practices, how to implement native applications that connect to these token-based backends. Okay, again, you know, um, I've been doing code reviews for a long time, and I've seen some scary stuff, to be honest, <laughs> when reviewing code, how people deal with you know, passwords and, and tokens and so on. So this library, uh, this, this spec is actually not, um, it's an RFC, but it's not a protocol, but they call that a best current practice, okay? So that's basically a document that has an RFC number, but it's mostly about giving you advice how to implement things, presumably in the most secure way, okay? Um, and that is RFC R8252, um, mostly driven by a guy from Google, William Dennis, uh, which will come up later again in some other discussions here. Um, but the very important thing is, um, you know, since Google does a lot mobile, um, they, they identified common pitfalls and, and, and you know, um, good, good ways to, to build these things. Um, so one thing, and that is like, <laughs> Um, so whenever I, I come to a customer and we talk about mobile, mobile clients, um, there will be a number of people in the room who want to write them in a different way than I want to write them. And it seems to be that um, the, like the, the most intuitive approach to, a, to someone with a native development background, when you have to implement authentication, 
what you do, what we always done, what we will, what we want to do for, um, forever, is write our own native authentication dialogues. Right? Uh, I write my own login page. This is kind of, um, according to this spec, uh, an anti-pattern because you know, uh, for several reasons. Let's talk about them actually. Yeah. So. Um, um, embedding your native login dialogues into your applications, you know, on one hand, I, 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 you know, I can't argue with that. It gives you like pixel perfect control over everything, the look and feel, and you know, you can make it animated and as fancy as you like, and you know, all the reasons I, I, I always hear about that. Um, but obviously, uh, if an application comes with its own login dialog, uh, obviously single sign-on cannot be a feature of that application because that is kind of like defeating the purpose of that, right? And we learned that um, when, you know, in dev development, for example, it, it is pretty much an anti-pattern these days to, to, to embed the login page into the application itself, but rather redirect to a server that does the authentication, okay? So anyways, um, let's say that's fine for you. You can implement it like that. You, you know, you have your own login page. Um, you send the name and the password to your token service. Um, you get back this access token, right? Then, and that's a very, very crucial step. That's what I always see or often see um, while re re reviewing these types of clients. You have to store that token securely now. Okay, so storing that token on on the device is much better than storing a password. Um, but it, it has to be done in the most secure way. And, you know, every platform has its own secure data uh, storage API, like, you know, the keychain on iOS and, you know, on Windows it's called DPA API and Android has something like that as well. And then from that point on, you can just use the token to talk to your backend APIs. And, you know, to be honest with you, that, that, that's already much, much better than how, how many people wrote applications like 10 years ago where you just stored the password on, on the device, right, and send the password on every single request to the backend service. Um, and again, I told you earlier that my background is this multi-client, multi-application, uh, or mostly at least, yeah. Um, so when, you know, again, when, when you only have one client application, your, your flagship, you know, mobile app, and the, the rest are APIs, then you know why should you even bother with having all that infrastructure with token services and all these things? So yeah, maybe that is what you want to do. Um, a couple of things I don't like typically about these uh, native dialogues, and most uh, and mostly it's about usability. Yeah. Um, so what I don't like is, for example, um, on one hand, I like strong passwords, but on the other hand, I don't like typing them in into a native dialog. So you know. Since I'm, I, I guess I'm a power user, right? So I, I, I have a password manager, and so I, you know, switch to the password manager and find my password and put it in the clipboard, and and then uh, copy and paste it to the native dialog, and then type in my email address, and yeah, it's all a very pleasant experience, yeah. Um, so if you are not a power user, I guess you either have to type in your password, or you know, uh, and because you have to do that several times with these types of apps, you choose really weak passwords. Yeah? Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is uh, you really shouldn't educate your users typing in their passwords all over the place. Typically, you know, like look, look at Google, for example, or look at Microsoft. They try to be very, very consistent with their login UI so that, you know, whenever you log into Microsoft, um, it, it's almost like, you, you, you know, if that login page would look different, you would be alarmed, kind of, at least I hope so. Um, so having these login dialogues all over the place, you know, makes your users less think about when they type in their password. That's at least my experience. Um, again, companies like Google, for example, they, they, they don't even allow this anymore. They don't have, a, have an endpoint anymore, anymore where you can send uh, a password and get a token back because obviously they don't want you that you type in your Gmail password into a third party app. And I guess that's that the reasons are pretty clear for that. So the, the other thing is, um, yep. Um, real quick. So Mark had a question, which uh, password manager do you recommend? Which one do you use? So I, I'm using one password 
and um, and the reason for that is basically because it covers all well, no, a couple of reasons. One is I wanted a native application installed on my machine, maybe because I'm very old now, yeah, and that's <laughs> how I think it should be done. Anyways, um, one password is a is a is, is an application you install on your phone, on your Mac, on your Windows machine, and it it uh, basically um, has a local password file which you can then in the background sync with things like Dropbox, for example. Yeah. Um, the thing I like about one password is is that it has basically plugins into all for all these devices. So if you are logging into a browser, right, which you typically do, um, I never type in my password because I just click the one password button in Safari or in Chrome, and then I un unlock my vault with my fingerprint, and that's it. Yeah, and that's my preferred login experience, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really it. Um, Thanks. There are others. Uh, I never really got the concept of browser-based password managers. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe again. Maybe I'm too old for that. Anyways, <laughs> um, what else did I want to say about that? I can't remember. Anyways, um, so the other thing, the other thing that this type of architecture prohibits are third-party logins, right? Again, the reason is clear. If let's say you want to log in with your Google account into this application, how would you do that? You typically you wouldn't you wouldn't type in your Gmail password here or your I don't know your Salesforce password or your Dropbox password into this native dialog. Um, that's just not how it works. Okay. Uh, okay. So that's just what I just said, just in in words. Yeah. The, the authentication workflow that the RFC recommends and that I recommend as well is, is a browser-based workflow where the application does not implement its own login logic at all. It just you know, opens the browser, goes to some URL, and then all of the authentication logic is, is, is implemented on a server. And again, in most scenarios or with most customers that I work with, you know, that server already exists, right? So they already have their or OpenID Connect provider. They already have their login page because they use it for other stuff as well, for their web applications and their JavaScript stuff and so on. So implementing it differently on a native device would just feel weird, yeah? So on that login page, you already have all the features, yeah? You have your logging and your auditing and your, you know, your uh, all your security, your fraud detection maybe, yeah? Um, you have your little buttons like log in with Google and log in with Facebook and um, the, the server side workflow. Yeah, let's say this user has to um, uh, agree to a new EULA, for example. Yeah, why would you implement that in, a, in an application? That, that could be part of the login workflow. Yeah, so you would just do that uh, as part of the login on your server. So, in other words, again, the whole idea behind that is, is that the client application uses authentication as a service, right? So the only thing it needs to know is basically is the start URL and it'll get called back um, by the server once authentication is done, right? And there are basically just two valid responses from an authentication server, either uh, a token which represents the user or an, or an error message, right? And that's all this client application has to implement. So now, um, when you know this approach, you need a browser, okay? Um, again, there are two types of browsers out there, and uh, if you you know um, um, if you have a certain background in UI <laughs> programming, like some of you have, um, we all know embedded web views, right? But basically, a browser control. Yeah. So you just you know open a browser inside your application. It, it's a browser without the Chrome uh, around, right? Um, and you know we can make things happen, yeah. And that's how many applications these days implement this authentication workflow, you know. Uh, and to be honest, I I, I hate it, yeah. <laughs> uh, and the reasons for that are that again, it gives you it gives you really bad usability, right? I mean, um, like one password or, or all of your password managers, they wouldn't work with these embedded web views, right? They they only work with the the real Safari and the real Chrome. Um, so again, you wouldn't get password manager support 
for these um, types of web views. Um, the next thing is you can't see the URL. You can't really see that you are in a browser. It's, it's something that looks like a browser, right? Um, it looks like the Google login page, but am I really on the Google login page or is just someone having a, you know, is a owner drawing that, that page, yeah? Um, that's the other thing. Um, the next thing is that these browsers are typically, you know, um, private, uh, private browser instances. So the cookie container that is, is private, it, meaning it, uh, the cookies that you, you get in this browser window are not shared with other browsers or the system browser. So, for example, things like single sign-on across browser uh, or application boundaries wouldn't work because, you know, that private browser doesn't know you are logged on um, with Google already at, at the system level because these cookies are not shared. Yeah? So actually Google, um, as the first company, and I, I, I put the, the link in here, um, put, put out a blog post last year, and that's again this William Dennis guy who also wrote the RSC. Basically they, and you might know that, um, uh, they basically announced that starting with April 2017, they will not allow showing the Google login page anymore in web views. Now you will get an error like unsupported agent or something like that. And um, um, it's not here, it's in my, diff in, in my other browser. <laughs> um, here's a, a stack overflow issue, yeah? Like uh, someone says like, oh, it, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, hmm, I, I'm wondering, you know, we are all developers, like we are wondering how does Google detect it's a web view? And of course, they're, they're, they're using some heuristics, right? Like looking at, at headers and the agent string and, and stuff like that. And yes, of course, you can trick Google into thinking it is not a web view. But funnily enough, this guy asks that question here. And listen, have a look who, who, who replies. William Dennis again. <laughs> and he says, you know what? You can do that, but we also changed um, we also changed our user data policy, saying do not mislead Google about an application's operating environment. So if you know Google figures out for some reason that you're having a popular application and you're using a web view to authenticate users, they will just disable your client ID and then your application wouldn't work anymore. So don't do it. Okay, web views are more like only do it if, if you have no other choice. And obviously the reason for Google being so harsh about that is because they have phishing problems with that, right? App, you know, applications opening windows that look like the Google login page, but they aren't, okay? So that's the whole thing about web views. Um, what is the recommended way uh, is the so-called system browser, right? The system browser is basically the most trusted piece of software on your machine. That is the, the piece of software that you do all your browsing with and your shopping and you know all your credit cards and your, your logins and you never lie to your search engine and you know it, it's a highly trusted piece of software. So also it, al it already accumulates all kinds of authentication sessions, right? So your, your Google login session and your, I don't know, your Azure login session and whatever. Um, there are chances that um, your system browser already has a single signs on session established with that service. So if your application uses the system browser for authentication, there's a high chance that this user is already authenticated or already has an existing uh, single sign on session with that service. And your application can benefit from that and thus make it a, a nicer login experience. Okay? So, the other reasons I like the system browser is, again, um, I can see the address bar. I can click on the certificate. Um, I have add-in support, meaning uh, things like 1Password and so on. They would work in that type of browser, right? Um, so that is the um, recommended way. Now, both Android and iOS, they have special browsers, so to speak, special browser controls, they feel like the old browser controls. They are something that you can interact with uh, from your application, but they are really the system browser. So um, there used to be this thing called the SF Safari View Controller in iOS, um, which used to, to fulfill that role. It, it, it was basically um, 
a tab of the Safari browser that you could open in your in your application. They actually changed that or changed the way this works in iOS 11 because um, of security reasons or mostly of privacy reasons. They wanted to block certain third party cookies and so on. So the, the Safari view controller is still uh, a, a, a Safari web control, but it has now in iOS 11 a private key, um, cookie container. So they created another one starting with, with iOS 11 called the SF uh, authentication session, uh, it's called. And that is, think of it as a special API that wraps um, a hardened version of Safari that you can use for authentication. It does share the cookies with the main Safari, um, but it, it does some per app isolation on, on third party cookies and cookies which are you know, not originating really from that application. So that is the one that you have to use. Um, otherwise, well, you won't get into the store, I guess. Um, on Android, there's a, it's called the Chrome custom tab. And again, the, the mindset around that is that you are opening a tab of Chrome in your own application, okay? So that's what you should use on the mobile devices. Now, how does that work? Um, and now this is the scary part with the protocols um, where, as I said, hopefully you have a client library which, which knows how to do these things right. But the idea is pretty simple, actually. Yeah? Um, your application uh, initiates, well, has to construct the URL. And this is OpenID Connect. Yeah? So the syntax of this URL is something you can read in the spec. And you need a client ID, so you need to, pre, need to be pre-registered with the OpenID Connect provider. Um, you need to tell the provider what you want to access. That's the scope parameter. And you know, uh, in this case, it means something like, give me the user ID and, and some profile information. And I want to access API 1 and API 2, which are the, the two things in my back end. And I want to delegate the identity of that user to these APIs. Um, the interesting part here, there's more, but the, the, the interesting part here is, is the redirect URI. So when on the server side, authentication is done, how do you transfer control back from that browser into your application? And um, you can, um, when you install your iOS application or your uh, Android application, you can register for a custom URL. Yeah? And, um, the idea is, if the browser opens that custom URL, then the operating system knows that this belongs to a certain app and transfers control back to this application. So you, you get a call back, basically. Yeah? And um, there's more stuff on it. Uh, there's a nonce, which is for replay attack protection, uh, which is a random number. There's a so-called code uh, challenge, which is a random number that's being hashed. Um, so you introduce a per request secret between the client and the server, again, too many details for an hour, but at the end of the day, when the authentication process is done, the, the, the browser will do the final redirect to the redirect URI, which is the registered URI, which belongs to your application, and then the browser will call back the application and will send the URL, basically, um, back to your application, and this will have two things. One is called the identity token. Think of it as the, the protocol response. It's a signed JSON web token that has things like, you know, uh, authentication method and authentication time and, uh, you know, token lifetimes and audiences. Again, lots of, you know, stuff that security people are really, you know, really like to talk about. Um, and a code. And once uh, after you uh, um, validated this identity token, um, you can make sure that this code is actually legitimate as well. And then you're sending that code to the token service and as a response, you get back the access token, okay? So the access token is now the thing that allows you to talk to APIs. The identity token is the thing that uh, allows you to validate that the response was legitimate, uh, the browser, you know, the, the, the browser lag response. Um, so typically what you now do is you use the access token to access the backend services. Um, access tokens have a finite lifetime and that is the expires in field here in seconds. So in, in this case, it's, it's uh, 60 minutes. And um, 
when the X token is expired, you can use the refresh token um, to get new access tokens, you know, like in, 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 in background tasks, so to speak, yeah? So you would store that refresh token in your keychain, for example, so it, 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 it's a long list artifact, and every time the X token expires, which you know because you get a 401 back from the API, is basically saying the token is not good anymore, you can reach into your keychain, get the refresh token, and get a new access token, and then for, for the next 60 minutes, you are again covered by that. Okay, so that sounds like a lot of work. Can I just not call an API, send the password, and that's it? <laughs> Wouldn't that be much, much simpler than, you know, opening a browser and doing hashing and nonces and callbacks and blah, blah, blah? Well, you're right. It, it, it probably is easier, but also less secure. And, you know, anyways. Um, the people that wrote this RFC, yeah, this spec, they, they basically said, okay, we are not only saying it's, it's, it's theoretically the best way to do it, they also did uh, reference implementations of that. And it's, it's called app of iOS and app of Android, and they are native, they are like uh, written in, in Objective-C and Java. So if you, you know, wanna have a look at that, um, that's, uh, that's the source code. And I basically took this idea um, and implemented the whole thing in C Sharp because, well, I'm a C Sharp guy. And, you know, by the magic of .NET standard library and all the fancy stuff, it actually works on all .NET platforms. So it works on, the, on, on .NET framework, so you can use it with WinForms and WPF. It works on .NET Core, and it works on Xamarin, which means it works on iOS and Android, and, um, and that's it. So let's actually switch to some code. So, you know, um, when, I'm not, when I'm not doing security work, I'm also a UI designer. So that's basically all I need, really. Yeah, it's a simple application. I can log in and I can call an API. So my, my, my plan really was all that complicated protocol stuff. Can I just somehow, um, can I just somehow um, abstract that into a single simple to use library? Okay, and I call that the OpenID Connect client. So I'm not going to bore you with me writing code, but the idea is um, that you're newing up this library. Uh, you pass in the base address of the server, actually. That's something um, you can use as well. It's called demo.identifier.io. We give you all the details here, like the, the client ID name and which scopes it can access and which uh, grant types it allows. And, Here's the test API you can call. And actually, I mentioned this discovery document earlier. So when you click this link here, that's the so-called discovery document. Um, you know, and as I said, it's a machine readable, it's also human readable um, um, description of your token service. For example, you know, where is this authorization endpoint? Where's the token endpoint? You know, wh where can I get the key material? Yeah, that's the public key I can use to validate these tokens that are coming back. and all, the, all the, the things you need to know, okay? So basically, I, ne I need to tell this library where is that token service. The client ID is the thing you have, you know, you register with the server. Then what do you want to access? Um, in that case, I want to access the user ID, the user's profile information, his email address, and an API. Now, that's the re redirect URI, and basically that is, must be the same as the one you registered for in your manifest. So when you go to here, you see there's this um, URL scheme. So I use this uh, thing called SF authentication example. And that's the one I'm using here as my redirect URI. And then that's basically up to you what you want to call that. Um, right. And then the whole idea is that, um, that this class here encapsulates the whole protocol thing. And then all I really want to do is, um, ugh, that's not what I want to do, is have one line of code, yeah? log in async, which does everything for you, okay? So I guess I need um, a login result member variable here. Um, this guy. So 
I, I mentioned earlier that there are different browsers, right? So you would use a different browser on iOS and you would use a different browser on uh, Android and Windows and so on. So that, that's why the browser is actually an extensibility point. Okay, so here's the browser implementation that is using the iOS 11 SF authentication session class, right? Which is the, the Safari thing. So, and the way this works is basically you give it a start URL, which is calculated by my library. You, you give it an end URL, which is your redirect URI. And basically, this will open a browser. It will hand off control to the browser. And once the browser navigates to this end URL, it will transfer control back to you. You do some error checking, and then um, you return whatever is coming back from that browser. Okay, then my library again takes over, does the validation of the response and does the back channel communication and you know gets the, the tokens and, and so on and so forth. So that's the whole idea behind that. And then at the end of the day, <clears throat> we can uh, call an API uh, by just getting the access, you know, get, getting the access token from the access token property of the login result. And you know, let's actually, I guess, let's try it. See if it works. Any questions? Yeah, we do have one there. Um, so we have a question. Okay. Can an, open, can an open ID server be run as a microservice in Azure Service Fabric? Only in Docker, I think. <laughs> um, so a, a microservice, I mean, whatever that means, right? <laughs> an, op an Open ID Connect provider is is a piece of software which has to implement multiple endpoints, yeah. And um, and so that by I think by my definition that that's not a microservice, yeah. Um, but an Open ID Connect provider is basically a, a set of endpoints that you can host in the cloud or on premise, whatever. Um, in the case of identity server that runs, you know, on, on Windows or on Linux or in a, in a Docker container, whatever, uh, Microsoft has a hosted version. It's called Azure Active Directory, right? Um, so yes, uh, it can be hosted in the cloud, uh, also in Azure, but it is not a microservice. It's a bit more complicated. Okay, cool. So now I click this login button here, which will trigger this line of code. Login async. Now, as part of, you know, you are using uh, an Apple service, yeah, they, they, um, they inject this, this dialog box here and there's nothing you can do about that. And the idea is that they want to make it really clear that now you are going to authenticate against a service, right? So they put in the name of the application, they put in the, the, um, um, the domain name of the authentication service. And again, this is, a, you know, it, it's basically about phishing attacks. Right, and now we are here, and again, you know, UI design is not my my most favorite thing. So you can make that more pretty. That that's that's feedback I often get, like, yeah, but the browser looks so ugly. I think you can make it more pretty. Um, you could now log in here if you want. You know, there's Bob and Bob and Alice and Alice. Uh, you know, every system needs uh, at least one Alice and one Bob. Um, we support external login, so that you know the. Um, I mentioned earlier, right, if you are already have an authentication session with Google on your device, you can reuse that because, hey, it's the system browser, right? So it's just the same as logging on to Google. So as you can see now, since I was actually um, taking advantage of that existing um, Google authentication session, I got single sign on, I just clicked the Google button and now I'm logged in with my Google account, okay? So here's my Gmail account and now I can call an API and what this does is it just echoes back my claims, okay? So let's run that again, um, just to show the local login. Um, which works exactly the same. Like here with um, Alice and Alice, and again, um, you know, what, what, what do you do with, with these proprietary things? I, I, I recommend typically put them on the server, right? Your, cli your, your client application doesn't need to know now the difference between the Google protocol and the Facebook one. Just put it on the OpenID Connect server and it basically abstracts these differences away. 
And here we are. Here's my here's my uh, token for Alice now, and I can now call the API, pretending I'm Alice. That's my subject ID here. Okay. So, so that's um, basically it. And uh, as I said, now what you would do now is um, is persist that refresh token in uh, in your keychain. And from that point on, you don't have to show this login dialog. I mean, if you don't want to, you can basically uh, now use the backend services as long as this refresh token is good for. And you know, that's a configuration thing. You know, like there could be, you know, a, a day, a month, forever, whatever, whatever you you configure um, for this particular client. Okay, so, so that's it. Um, um, I I totally agree that it is more complicated than just making an API call at least technically speaking, under the covers. But if you have a good uh, or decent client library, um, as you can see, you can pretty much get away with one line of code. And I think that's, that's, um, that's what, what it should be. Okay, so that's, that's it from my side. Um, Great, so we have uh, one more question here. Uh, do you have sample yes. projects and code that load the roles yes. and the claims from yes. the database? Yes. So, so basically, um, all I showed you right now, so the, 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 the library itself, is a, it's on GitHub, it's called OIDC Client. Yeah, that's, uh, that's where you get the library itself, and there, there's a link, and there, there's some code samples here as well. And um, there is another repo, uh, OIDC Client.samples. And here, basically, you can see, um, um, there, there's an iOS client which works up to iOS uh, 10, and there's an iOS 11 client, there's WPF and WinForms and UWP. There's a console client, there's an Android client, uh, there's an Android with Chrome custom tabs client, and if somebody out there, um, you know, wants to learn the technology and, and basically provide um, more samples, or like, you know, taking the Android client and taking the iOS client and uh, producing an assembly in forms application, which, which works over both. Um, uh, we, you know, we, we take pull requests. Yeah. All right, fantastic. So again, if anybody has any questions, now's your chance to ask them. Uh, otherwise, I know we covered a lot of stuff and I was telling Dominic right when we started that uh, in my 25 years of programming, I think OAuth and authentication is uh, my least favorite thing. And I really appreciate all the work that's gone into Identity Server to make it easy for all of us. Uh, it's a really great uh, tool that we should be investigating. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you for your time today. Um, we have recorded this, so this will be up on our website in uh, the next couple of days. But uh, other than that, thank you. So thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you, Dominic. Bye-bye. All right. Bye, everyone.